Сегодня нам часто рассказывают, что Сталин и Гитлер были фактически близнецами что Советский Союз, как никакая другая страна, вложился в экономическую мощь фашистской Германии, придав тем самым ценности европейской демократии и подготовив войну. Говорят, к примеру, что в тайных школах Советского Союза обучались нужные для грядущей войны кадры. Такие школы действительно существовали. Например, в Липецке где наряду с советскими пилотами с 1925 года по 1933 немецкие инструкторы за немецкий счет подготовили 220 немецких летчиков. Для сравнения, в нелегальных школах самой Германии около 2000 летчиков. Но на секундочку, это все-таки было до прихода Гитлера ко власти. А в 1933 году военное сотрудничество СССР и Германии было свернуто, школы закрыты, а торговый оборот сократился по сравнению с 1932 годом вдвое. А в 1937 году в пять раз. А вот у западных демократий все было как раз наоборот. By a strange coincidence, on the eve of the Reichstag elections, an elephant seal was brought to the Berlin Zoo. When Hitler seized power on January 30th, 1933, he ruled a country with a foreign debt of nearly 19 million marks, of which 1.7 million were owed to Great Britain. Yet already on February 17th of the same year, Germany's major creditors signed an agreement that they would not demand payment. A year later, this agreement was extended. On June 14, 1934, Germany's National Bank announced it would no longer pay any foreign debts or the interest on them. Instead of money, Germany's creditors received bonds that promised a 3% return over 10 years. The London Stock Exchange Gazette on May 3, 1935, tells us, time and time again, Germany has defaulted on her obligations, public and private, but she has gone on buying wool, cotton, nickel, rubber, and petrol until her requirements were fulfilled. And the financing has been done directly or indirectly through London. Why were the British being so indulgent? Perhaps they had just got the German chancellor they wanted? Let us open Mein Kampf and read what the future Führer of Germany wrote during his jail sentence after the unsuccessful putsch of November 1923. If land was desired in Europe, it could be obtained only at the expense of Russia by the German sword, sawed for the German plow, and daily bread for the nation. For such a policy, there was but one ally in Europe, England. With England alone, was it possible, our rear protected, to begin the new Germanic march? Hitler had just as many reasons to appreciate the United States. By the early 1930s, over 60 American corporations had branches in Germany, and under Hitler, the numbers grew further still. Western businesses actively aided the Third Reich in setting up military manufacturing. The designers of the Messerschmitt 109 fighter planes and the Junker 87 dive bombers could not test their creations out for lack of engines. Here, the British came to the rescue by selling Rolls-Royce guest airplane engines. Without the British, 
Germany's war manufacturing might have started much later and Germany would not have had the necessary material for launching World War II. Hitler's regime was given favored nation status also in foreign policy. On January 13, 1935, Britain and France did not intervene when a referendum was held in Saarland. The Führer carried out a bold agitprop campaign and won for himself a region rich in coal. On March 18, 1935, Hitler unilaterally withdrew from the Versailles Treaty established at the end of World War I, which had limited the size of Germany's army. The reaction from London and Paris was apathetic because they knew Hitler and were sure that the dictator was arming Germany for an attack on the East. On June 18, 1935, a naval treaty was signed between Germany and the UK, according to which Germany could boast 35% the number of warships as Britain and 100% the number of submarines. On March 7, 1936, Germany moved military forces into the Rhineland, which had been made a demilitarized zone after World War I. London and Paris again reacted only weakly. As Hitler recalled, the 48 hours following the entry into the Rhineland were the most nerve-wracking of my life. Had the French charged into the Rhineland, we would have had to pull back. The military strength which we possessed could have in no way mounted even a moderate resistance. On March 13, 1938, Hitler annexed Austria. On November 12, 1918, the Austrian National Assembly had recognized the country as an integral part of Germany. And on March 2nd of the following year, 1919, the governments of both nations signed a preliminary statement in Berlin on the creation of a single state. The subsequent Entente had categorically ruled out any unification, but now Hitler was allowed to send troops into Austria and organize a referendum under Nazi control. On September 30th, 1938, Britain and France signed the Munich Agreement with Hitler, which allowed the German dictator to seize that part of Czechoslovakian territory with a German population and ultimately all of the Czech lands. Recall how this all happened, because today we in Russia are blamed for all this. The negotiations in Munich included only Germany, Italy, the UK and France. Czechoslovakia's representatives Wojciech Mostny and Hubert Masaryk were shut out and only informed later. They were then given an ultimatum that if Prague did not accept the annexation, it would have to deal with the Germans all on its own. Of the 14.8 million citizens of Czechoslovakia, the Germans amounted to 3.5 million. There were over 3 million Slovaks and the Hungarian, Rusin, Polish, and Jewish minorities added up to over a million more people. Most Germans, Hungarians, and Poles did not want to fight against their ethnic kin. Faced with such a situation, the Czechs had no way to defend themselves. After Britain and France signed the Munich Agreement with Germany, the Czechs capitulated. Germany seized the Sudetenland, and German tanks stopped just 30 kilometers from Prague. Hungary took Slovakia's southern regions, and Poland took the south of Sieszyn Silesia. Hitler guaranteed that the rest of Czechoslovakia would be left alone, but he soon provoked the separation of the Czech lands and Slovakia, and thus had a pretext for breaking his promise. And so, on March 14, 1939, the Czech lands were made part of Germany and referred to as the Bohemia and Moravia Protectorate. Hungary took Transcarpathia, and the Slovak rump state became merely a Nazi puppet. By late 1938, 
the metallurgical industries in Siesian Silesia were producing 41% of Poland's cast iron and nearly 47% of its steel. The Germans were not the only vultures feasting on dead Czechoslovakia. Right after the Munich Agreement, the Polish government demanded that the Siesian border region be handed over to it. Those heroic traits which the Polish people possess should not make us turn a blind eye to this nation's recklessness and ingratitude, which for centuries have caused it immeasurable suffering. In 1919, the Allies' victory had finally turned Poland, after many generations of thraldom, into an independent republic. But after the partition of Czechoslovakia, England and France were all too happy to push Hitler toward the east, and then they sought to undermine talks between Germany and Russia on Poland so that the Nazis would not conclude a treaty with the USSR. Yet today, the vast majority of Polish political commentators tell, with great fervor, a totally different story about how Hitler and Stalin mistreated their fine and upstanding nation. Western democracies nod favorably at this, though they, of course, know how it was. And this is how it was. According to the Treaty of Versailles, the German port of Danzig was separated from Germany and turned into a free city under the League of Nations. Danzig was in a customs union with Poland and could only maintain its international ties through Warsaw. Hitler demanded that Danzig be handed back to the Third Reich and that highways and railways be built to connect Eastern Prussia with mainland Germany through the so-called Polish Corridor. The Poles were openly seeking friendship with Hitler and hoped that with his help, they could seize not only Czechoslovakian territory, but also parts of the Soviet Union. However, they were loath to surrender Danzig, though it wasn't theirs anyway. Therefore, on March 26, 1939, Poland refused to accede to German demands, expecting that Britain and France would come to its aid. On March 31st, the British indeed promised such help. In turn, Germany withdrew from the Anglo-German Naval Treaty and its policy of non-aggression against Poland. The USSR's chief diplomat, Maxim Litvinov, had already suggested on March 18th that a conference draw together the Soviet Union, Britain, France, Romania, Poland, and Turkey with the aim of forestalling German aggression. However, London did not want to commit to any obligations. Foreign Secretary Edward Halifax asked Moscow if it would accept a unilateral declaration of assistance, that is, whether it would be prepared to take on Germany for Poland and Romania's sake, while London and Paris stood on the sidelines. Halifax declined the Soviet Union's proposal that he travel to Moscow for negotiations. As Churchill claimed, but here is an offer, a fair offer, and a better offer, in my opinion, than the terms which the government seek to get for themselves, a more simple, a more direct, and a more effective offer. Churchill was in this a visionary who foretold the whole picture of the next several years. Just listen to him. Only on August 12th did negotiations finally begin in Moscow on a possible military treaty. The Soviet Union was represented by Klement Voroshilov, the top man in the army. By comparison, the French delegation was led by General Joseph Dumaine, a mere regional commander. Britain was represented by Admiral Reginald Drax, who was the commander-in-chief of Plymouth. Neither the British nor the French sent anyone authorized to sign an agreement. The USSR offered some clear proposals, but these met with no interest from London and Paris. Admiral Drax had, in fact, been given instructions that under no circumstances did the British government wish to make any specific commitments that would bind their hands. Meanwhile, the Poles categorically refused to even consider letting the Red Army cross their territory. The Polish commander-in-chief, 
Edward Rids Smigley, declared on August 19th, regardless of the consequences, we will not allow Russian troops to ever occupy a single inch of Polish territory. Under these circumstances, any further negotiations were senseless. And so the USSR moved to conclude instead a non-aggression pact with Germany. We had no other choice. These vaunted Western democracies and self-spiting Poland left us no choice at all. When Germany attacked Poland on September 1, 1939, the Polish leadership quickly ran for their lives. At 3.15 a.m. on September 17, 1939, the Soviet government handed Václav Grzebowski, the ambassador to the USSR, a note. The Polish government has collapsed and shows no signs of life. This means that the Polish state and its government have ceased to exist. Therefore, the treaties concluded between the USSR and Poland have been terminated. Left to its own devices and without leadership, Poland has become a convenient field for all sorts of accidents and surprises that could threaten the Soviet Union. The Soviet government, hitherto neutral, can no longer remain indifferent to the fact that Ukrainian and Belarusian kin living in Poland are left to fend for themselves, left defenseless. In view of this situation, the Soviet government has instructed the Red Army to order troops to cross the border and take under their protection the lives and property of the population of Western Ukraine and Western Belarus. Wasn't this how things really happened? Obviously, Stalin was supposed to just let Germany grab the whole of Poland, but instead, he did a bad thing. The only bad thing Stalin did was moving the borders farther from Moscow, but this proved vital later. It's quite possible that this decision saved both us and the Poles whom we liberated, and everyone today who speaks of Soviet occupiers. They would hardly be able to wax so eloquently if we had not entered the Western territories of the Ukraine and Belarus, which then belonged to Poland. Finally, it is important to note that when the Polish commander-in-chief, Edward Rydz Smigli, gave orders to his troops, he did not take the arrival of Red Army troops as a declaration of war, and he told his forces not to fight the Soviets. Moreover, the League of Nations did not declare the USSR an aggressor state and Churchill once again proved the most reasonable person, and he acknowledged, though with reservations, the correctness of the USSR's position. He said, Russia has pursued a cold policy of self-interest. We could have wished that the Russian armies should be standing on their present line as the friends and allies of Poland instead of as invaders, but that the Russian armies should stand on this line was clearly necessary for the safety of Russia against the Nazi menace. Today, commentators speak of these times as if they occurred in a vacuum with merely two players, Stalin and Hitler, and others played hardly any role. In fact, others nearly refused to play a role. What was the French army, considered Europe's strongest, doing as the Germans invaded Poland? The French began mobilization on August 21st and by the end of September, they had 82 divisions, reinforced by 50 tank battalions and numerous heavy artillery, including 400 and 520 millimeter railway guns. They were opposed by 43 German divisions with much weaker artillery, without a single tank and a very limited amount of ammunition. 82 divisions against 43. Yes, from September 7th to the 12th, the French did take 12 border villages in the Saarland, but then they abandoned them without even reaching the Germans' main positions. In these battles, around 1,000 men died on both sides. Then the fighting stopped entirely and the so-called phony war set in. 
the French command worried that their soldiers would grow bored and restless, and so they ordered that footballs be delivered to them. Churchill looked back on the French army's failure to launch an attack on Germany. After completing their mobilization, he said, they remained inactive along the entire front. The French government even asked Britain not to attack Germany by air, as this could lead to reprisals against French military enterprises. The British limited themselves to dropping leaflets, which appealed to Germany's sense of morality. This strange stage of the war on the ground and in the skies astonished everyone. France and Britain took no action for weeks as the German war machine devastated and subjugated Poland. The war in the skies can be traced from the account of British bomber ace Guy Gibson. Gibson's Lancaster bomber took off for the first time to fight the Germans on the same day war was declared, but after it came under Nazi fire, it dropped all its bombs into the water. Then a long break of seven and a half months followed. Only on April 19, 1940, did Gibson get to fly again. British planes mainly attacked coastal points or small towns that were nearly undefended. No one raised their voices in favor of attacking the Third Reich's military bases, and the idea of bombing German industrial targets seemed utter blasphemy. When Leo Emery, British Secretary of State for Indian Affairs, suggested to Minister of Aviation Kingsley Wood that Britain drop a few incendiary bombs on the Black Forest as the Germans were using its timber for military purposes, the Minister of Aviation furiously refused claiming that such sites were private property and bombing them would alienate American public opinion. Considering that many German factories belonged specifically to Americans like Rockefeller and Ford, the concerns were clear, and this is why the leaflets Churchill mentioned had to be dropped instead. Marshal of the Royal Air Force Arthur Harris wrote, my personal view is that the only thing we achieved was largely to supply the continent's requirements of toilet paper for the five long years of the war. One more contribution by European democracies to the building of fascism. And we are hardly joking, for jokes would be inappropriate when we know how all this ended. But it also doesn't hurt to know how it all began. It began with European democracies lending solid support to Nazi Germany in its economic development. Then, when the time came to make war on Germany, European democracies did this very badly. If at any of these stages they had just engaged with the USSR, then the most terrible war in humankind's history and the Holocaust would never have happened. Nothing would have happened, but it did. In all good conscience, Western democracies should be making amends for their aid to Nazi Germany, or at least their failure to resist it. Meanwhile, it is we who are blamed, we who prove the victors and saviors of humankind.